Welcome back to Think for Christ. Today we embark on the second episode in our series on evangelical anti-intellectualism. This episode is called, Why Should We Care? In the previous episode, I talked about the problem of anti-intellectualism and how it has been manifested at the level of the individual Christian, the church, and the university, and the wider culture. And if you haven't yet listened to that episode, I'd recommend doing so before you listen to this one. Here, I'm going to briefly describe the disastrous fallout of the evangelical inattention to the mind at these various planes of the Christian life in America. And as we're going to see, we should care about the problem of anti-intellectualism, because neglecting the Christian mind has had consequences that reach far beyond the local church. But first, let's do a promo. Christians who neglect the nurturing and growth of their minds as part of their devotion to Christ miss out on the deep and enriching benefits that come from a seasoned intellect. Now, I'm going to be devoting an entire series focused on the benefits of developing a life of the mind, and so I'll wait until then to unpack this idea. Let me just say, for now, that the life of the mind is a vital part of Christian discipleship. Too many evangelicals buy into the false dichotomy that is often drawn between the heart and the head. We're often told it's the heart that matters to Christ, not the head. The heart here meaning the affections, such as love and passion, as well as the will to believe. But there's a double confusion here. First, the biblical usage of the word heart is very broad, and it often includes the intellect as well as the affections and the will. And second, affections and faith that are not anchored in the truth are not virtuous. Passion, apart from truth, is just emotionalism. Faith, apart from truth, is just credulity and blind. The path to the heart is through the head. Healthy passion and genuine faith are grounded in the truth. And truth, of course, is known by the intellect. And this is why transformation comes from the renewing of the mind, as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12. We are progressively transformed as we develop a deeper and deeper knowledge of the truth. Spiritual transformation comes from understanding the truth, thinking about the truth, meditating on the truth, and to utilize the confused expression, the road to the heart leads through the head. Again, passion and faith must be grounded in truth. Ignorance is not a Christian virtue. virtue. Believers do not earn brownie points with God for being stupid. Contrary to popular evangelical parlance, knowledge matters in the Christian life. To neglect the head is to neglect the heart. And to the degree that evangelicals have neglected the mind as a vital part of spiritual transformation, to that degree they have also neglected their souls. Which is why J.P. Moreland can say, the contemporary Christian mind is starved, and as a result, we have small, impoverished souls. As I said, we'll say more about the many blessings of a mature mind in service to Christ in a separate series. Here I want to focus on what have been the deleterious effects of evangelical anti-intellectualism, first on the American church and then on the American culture. The general neglect of the intellect among many evangelical congregations has contributed to several crises facing the American church today. Now, I use the word contributed here deliberately. 
I'm not saying that anti-intellectualism is the sole or only reason for the problems that we are facing. That would be too hasty. There are other contributing factors as well, of course. What I am saying is that the neglect of the intellect is one of the primary contributing factors to the crisis facing the church today. So what are the problems within American Christianity today? Well, the first and most urgent one is that we are losing our young people. This is a crisis facing the Christian community at large and not just the evangelical community. Most people are generally aware that young people in America are becoming significantly less religious than previous generations. Study after study bears this out. A 2019 Pew Research poll shows that more than 8 in 10 members of the silent generation, those born between, between 1928 and 1945, describe themselves as Christians, it's 84%, as do three quarters of baby, baby boomers, it's 76%. In stark contrast, only half of millennials, that's 49%, describe themselves as Christians. Four in 10 are religious nuns, and one in 10 millennials identify with non-Christian faiths. In the 2016 book Exodus, Why Americans Are Leaving Religion and Why They're Unlikely to Come Back, scholars from the Public Religious Research Institute find that today, nearly 4 in 10, 39% young adults ages 18 through 29 are religiously unaffiliated, three times the unaffiliated rate, 13%, among seniors age 65 and older. While previous generations were also more likely to be religiously unaffiliated in their 20s, young adults today are nearly four times as likely as young adults a generation ago to identify as religiously unaffiliated. In an ABC News and Washington Post religious affiliation poll conducted by the Langer Research Associates in 2018 found that young people age 18 to 29 are increasingly non-religious at a pace that far exceeds their older counterparts. From 2003 to 2017, the number of 18 to 29 year olds who identify as non-religious has increased 16%, from 19% to 35% of the American population, while the percentage of Americans over the age of 50 who identify as non-religious has only increased 5% from 8% to 13%. Corresponding to the general irreligious trend among American youth is the so-called flight of young people from the church. America's churches are bleeding young adults, and at an alarming rate. A 2007 LifeWay research study found that 70% of church young adults will leave the faith in college. Seven in 10 Protestants ages 18 to 30, both evangelical and mainline, who went to church regularly in high school, said that they quit attending by age 23. In 2002, the Southern Baptist Convention's Family Life Council study found that 88% of the children in evangelical homes leave church at the age of 18. 70% of teenagers involved in church youth groups stop attending church within two years of their high school graduation. In his 2009 book, The Present Future, Six Tough Questions for the Church, Reggie McNeil finds that a whopping 90% of youth active in high school church programs drop out of church by the time that they're sophomores in college. In the Great Opportunity Study by Pine Tops Foundation Veritas Forum 2019 found that about 35 million youths raised in Christian homes will depart from their faith over the next 30 years. The number of young people leaving the church could reach 42 million. Now, obviously, these are alarming statistics, but why is this happening? Well, when given the chance to explain their departure from the faith of their youth, most young adults cite intellectual reasons as the primary motivating factor. In his 1997 book, Why Christian Kids Leave the Faith, Tom Bissett interviewed people and asked them when, why, and how they abandoned their faith. He identified four prominent reasons. The first on the list was that they left because they had troubling, unanswered questions about the faith. In their 2005 book, Soul Searching, The Religious and Spiritual Lives of American Teenagers, Christian Smith 
and Melinda Lindquist Denton found that students leave the faith behind primarily because of intellectual doubt and skepticism. They asked questions why they fell away from the faith in which they were raised. This was an open-ended question where no multiple choice answers were given. 32% said that they left the faith behind because of intellectual skepticism or, skepticism or doubt. It didn't make any sense anymore, they said. Some stuff is too far-fetched for me to believe. I think scientifically, and there is no real proof. And too many questions that can't be answered. In his 2016 book, You Lost Me, Why Young Christians Are Leaving the Church and Rethinking Faith, David Kinneman summarizes a five-year project conducted by the Barna Group. The research uncovered six significant themes motivating the mass exodus of young people from the church. Now, five of the six top reasons are intellectual in nature. For example, their experience of Christianity, they say, is shallow. They see churches as being antagonistic to science. They struggle with the church's teaching on sexuality. They wrestle with the exclusive nature of Christianity. And they think that the church is unfriendly to those who doubt. Not surprisingly, pollsters are also finding that a sizable majority of young Christians possess a very poor understanding of the faith. It seems that our Christian youth lack both a knowledge of what they believe and why they believe it. It's no wonder that so many fall away when they leave their Christian homes. Back in 1999, Barna conducted an extensive survey of the beliefs of Christian-raised teenagers, which revealed that young people were beginning to embrace a different version of Christianity than that of their parents. 63% didn't believe Jesus is the son of the one true God. 58% believe that all faiths teach equally valid truths. 51% didn't believe Jesus rose from the dead. 65% didn't believe that Satan was a real entity. 68% didn't believe that the Holy Spirit was a real entity. In her 2010 book, Almost Christian, What the Faith of Our Teenagers is Telling the American Church, Kenda Creasy Dean argues that most of the teenagers within the American churches hold to what she calls a moralistic, therapeutic deism. Now, according to this view, a God exists who created and orders the world and watches over human life on earth. God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. The central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. And good people go to heaven when they die. She says, if teenagers lack an articulate faith, it may be because the faith we show them is too spineless to merit much in the way of conversation. Elizabeth Corey of the Youth Theological Initiative at Emory University argues that teens want to be challenged. They want their tough questions taken on. She says, we think they want cake, but they actually want steak and potatoes. But we keep giving them cake. We are failing our young people by feeding them what she calls the gospel of niceness. Too many church youth groups across this country are centered around entertainment, experience, emotionalism. Too few are equipping their youth against the pressures of their faith that they're feeling right now from the culture and against the veritable onslaught of their faith that they're going to face in the university. Unless the American church can fight back and prevent the anti-Christian culture from capturing the minds of her youth, the future of the church in this country is grim. We need to be able to equip the minds of our young people, and we need to have intelligent, well-reasoned answers for the questions that they have. Now, as evangelicals, not only are we losing our kids, we're also losing our thinkers. A quiet exit has been happening in the American Evangelical Church that has largely gone unnoticed. Many believers who are gifted with intellectual prowess are leaving the evangelical church for other Christian traditions, where their gifts are appreciated, where they can find encouragement, where they can enjoy a supportive community. 
Among the problems of evangelicalism, Oz Guinness includes the continued defections of thinking evangelicals in the direction of Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy. He notes that there are several factors driving thinking Christians away from the evangelical church, among which are the superficial or bad theology, uh, the lack of a robust apology for the faith, and the failure to produce a constructive philosophy. He says, Catholics, by contrast, can boast of strengths that are alluring precisely because they coincide with evangelical weaknesses. For example, in regard to authority, tradition, liturgical worship, aesthetics, and a constructive public philosophy. I myself have witnessed this defection from evangelicalism to Catholicism on too many occasions. I've watched as deeply thinking Protestant believers who have become frustrated with the evangelical church's unwillingness to care for the mind, leave it for a Christian tradition that has a long and rich history of intellectual pursuit. It's a real shame. Our churches are losing critical soldiers at a time when they are needed the most. We need to make a place for these individuals to utilize their giftings in the local church, and we need to encourage and support them as they pursue scholarship and careers in academia. The final struggle that is confronting the evangelical church today, at least in part because of its deep-rooted anti-intellectualism, is the feminization of church life. Please hear me out. I know I'm on thin ice here and in danger of being canceled in just my third episode. So as a disclaimer, what I'm about to say about the differences between men and women is a generalization. It is not a stereotype. Whereas stereotypes crystallize individuals into rigid categories, generalizations admit of exceptions, though they remain accurate characteristics of most members of a group. So if you're a male or female that doesn't fit this generalization, that's totally fine. It doesn't change the fact that most do. Now, what I mean by the feminization of church life is simply that most evangelical churches today appeal more to the feminine nature rather than to the masculine nature. Most of our churches are more attractive to ladies and less attractive to men. Our Sunday services are music heavy, relational, and structured to elicit an emotional experience. Our smaller weekly gatherings are, again, heavily relational and generally appeal to the affective side of the personality. And as a result, the church is predominantly female. Most estimates are somewhere around a 60-40 split between women and men. And most local churches struggle to attract and retain men. So although our evangelical churches are largely led by men, most are feminized and mat matriarchal in character. And this is unique to Christianity in America. Other religious, um, major religious systems don't have this kind of um, disparity between men and women. Now, before you pull out the tar and feathers, this observation, it's not original to me. Several scholarly books and articles have been written on the feminization of Christianity in America, and the imbalance in church life has been recognized and called out repeatedly. For example, here are two relatively recent books that address the issue, The Church Impotent, The Feminization of Christianity by Leon J. Pottles, and Why Men Hate Going to Church by David Morrow. Of course, if you're a man and you attend an evangelical church in America today, you probably don't need to be told that your church is geared more towards women than to men. Just think about the kind of songs that you sing when you go to church. Most worship music today is heavy on sentiment and light on doctrine. It's often remarked that if you replace references to God or Christ in our worship songs with the word baby, they'll sound just like romance songs between a man and a woman that you would hear on the radio. Contract, uh, contrast this with the great Christian hymns of the past that speak of God's sovereignty, lordship, power, justice. And sermons, too, have generally become touchy-feely in most churches today and appeal to emotions and stress inner spiritual experiences. Like our music, sermons are often light on doctrine and heavy on sentimentality. They often, they're often um, therapeutic rather than intellectually challenging. 
And many of our pastors tend to embody the characteristics of gentleness, sensitivity, and a nurturing spirit. Evangelical scholar Nancy Piercy asks, if religion is defined primarily in terms of emotional experience and is therapeutic, then who is it going to attract as ministers? Piercy asks us to consider a typical youth pastor. She says, he's really into relationships, very motivating. But is he teaching good apologetics? Is he teaching youth to use their minds and to understand deeper theological truths? At least the ones I've known haven't. And today, the common trajectory is for youth pastors to become senior pastors. Again, this is a generalization that admits of exceptions. There are churches out there that break this mold with thick worship songs, heavy-hitting sermons, and manly pastors. Now, you might be asking, what does this have to do with anti-intellectualism? Well, the feminization of the church is actually related to anti-intellectualism in two ways. First, the feminization of Christianity has its roots in the anti-intellectualist turn within evangelicalism. And we're going to look at this history in some detail in a future episode. At the same time, the evangelical church in America was retreating from the public sphere and the marketplace of ideas in the 19th century. It began to pitch its appeal primarily to women. In her seminal book, Total Truth, Piercy sketches this connection. The underlying dynamic is that the church was adopting a defensive strategy vis-a-vis -vis the culture at large. Many churchmen simply retreated from making cognitive claims for religion that could be defended in the public sphere. Instead, they transferred faith to the private sphere of experience and feelings, which put it squarely in the domain of women. There was a presumption that religion was on the run from the public realm of hard-headed men, retreating to the private realm of soft-hearted women. In short, instead of challenging the growing secularism among men, the church largely acquiesced by turning to women. The churches were turning religion and morality into the domain of women, something soft and comfortable, not bracing and demanding. In speaking to the same historical situation, historian Ann Douglas writes in her classic, The Feminization of American Culture, that ministers lost a toughness, a sternness, an intellectual rigor, which our society then and since has been accustomed to identify with masculinity. She goes on to explain that the church generally exchanged these masculine traits with the feminine traits of care, nurturing, sentimentalism, and retreated from the harsh, competitive environment of the public arena. Now, the second way in which the feminization of Christianity is related to anti-intellectualism is that the orientation of the church toward the more feminine traits of sentimentality, emotion, care, nurture, tends to reinforce the imbalance within the church of the focus on the affections over and against the intellect. Now again, a disclaimer here. I know many women who are very intellectual. In my own academic work, I've encountered brilliant first-class scholars that are female, like Nancy Percy. So again, what I'm going to say is a generalization that is true of most, but not all women and men. The evangelical church has generally lost the masculine strengths of intellectual engagement. The truth is that men are drawn to the more intellectual side of the faith. As Percy observes, the more traditionally masculine side of Christianity enjoys crossing swords with hostile secular worldviews. So as long as Christianity appeals to the emotional, therapeutic, interpersonal, relational areas, it's not going to appeal to men as much as to women. According to scholars like Percy, Douglas, Pottles, and Murrow, the feminization of Christianity reinforces the neglect of the mind in our churches, which in turn keeps many men away. In his extensive experience of decades-long ministry, William Lane Craig is convinced that a key to drawing men back to the church 
is by offering an intellectually rich experience and specifically teaching men how to defend the faith. He writes, apologetics is a key to making the church and Christian faith relevant to men once more. People think that by having sports programs or men's barbecues, the church will draw in more men. But I'm convinced that the best kept secret to drawing men is apologetics. Men need to see that Jesus of Nazareth was not only a tough guy, but a smart guy. I never suspected that apologetics would have this special effect on men. I had no intention of ministering particularly to men in this ministry. But the appeal of apologetics to men is just undeniable. And I can personally second Craig's experience here. I found that most men want more than an enriching emotional experience from church. Men want to be intellectually challenged. They want to know the truth. They want to learn theology. They want to know how to defend the truth. They want to be equipped in apologetics. They want to think deeply about their faith and its relevance to every aspect of life, including politics, business, and culture. Men want a cause to defend, a war to fight. Men love to debate and engage one another intellectually. Men want something challenging, bracing, demanding. And the anti-intellectualism so prevalent in most of our evangelical churches today is doing a great disservice to our Christian brothers. The importance of reclaiming a place for men in the church is not just relevant for Christian men. As you are no doubt well aware, there's a cultural war going on today against men in our country. Men are being stripped of their masculinity. They're being emasculated by our culture. Traditional masculine traits are now being labeled toxic by the ideological brokers of our society. Many men, especially young men, are now lost and increasingly feeling unwelcome in our culture. They're struggling with misplaced guilt for sins that they did not commit. And this explains the incredible popularity of clinical psychologist Jordan Peterson. Against the tide of our popular culture, Peterson is telling young men everywhere that it's okay to be masculine, that it's good to be a man, that our world desperately needs manly men. Peterson, who does not identify as a Christian, has recently admonished the Christian church to make a place for these lost young men in their congregations. He writes, the Christian church is there to remind people, young men included, and perhaps even first and foremost, that they have a woman to find, a garden to walk in, a family to nurture, an ark to build, a land to conquer, a ladder to heaven to build, and the utter terrible catastrophe of life to face stalwartly in truth, devoted to love and without fear. He says, invite the young men back. Say literally to these young men, you're welcome here. If no one else wants what you have to offer, we do. We want to call you to the highest purpose of your life. We want your time and energy and effort and your will and your goodwill. We want to work with you to make things better, to produce life more abundant for you and for your wife and children and for commun your community and your country and for the world. So look, as long as we continue in our anti-intellectualism, we cannot hope to meet Peterson's challenge of filling our churches with young men eager for a place that appreciates their masculinity. So these are some of the unfortunate consequences that have come about in the church, at least in part, because of the long-standing neglect of the mind. However, it's not just the American church that has experienced the fallout of evangelical anti-intellectualism. American culture, too, has suffered deeply by the lack of a strong public Christian influence in the marketplace of ideas. In particular, the evangelical abandonment of the university has been devastating to the spiritual and moral fabric of our society. Whether we like it or not, the universities and centers of higher education are America's tutors. They are the primary force shaping the institutions of learned culture, of government, of mass media, and of the entertainment and technology industries. Mark Knoll writes, the great institutions of higher learning in Western culture function as the mind of Western culture. 
They define what's important. They specify procedures to be respected. They set the agendas for analyzing the practical problems of the world. They provide vocabulary for dealing with the perennial great issues. They produce the books that get read and that over decades continue to influence thinking around the world. And they do these tasks, not only for the people who are aware of their existence, but for us all. When evangelicals abandoned the university at the turn of the 20th century, they left the mind of the nation utterly defenseless against the ideological assault of anti-Christian views. And as a result, our culture rapidly secularized and is today degenerating at an increasingly alarming rate. J.P. Moreland argues that we now live in one of the most secular cultures in history. He writes, three of the major centers of influence in our culture, the university, the media, and the government, are largely devoid of serious religious discussion. He goes on to say that the present situation has emerged in no small measure because a marginalized and inarticulate church withdrew into privatized religion as she welcomed the Trojan horse of anti-intellectualism within her walls. As a culture, we have experienced a violent worldview shift from a Judeo-Christian understanding of reality to a post-Christian one. And for Moreland, this shift itself expresses a growing anti-intellectualism in the church, resulting in a marginalization of Christianity in society. Anti-Christian ideas now have a near complete stranglehold on our institutions of higher learning, not to mention our K-12 public education, which means we have all but lost our voice in the primary centers of cultural influence. Let's face it, the church is no longer a major participant in the war of ideas. The church's influence on society today is now weaker than it's ever been in the history of this country. Now, you may think, so what, right? Who cares? After all, Christ came to save souls, not human societies. Our job as Christians, after all, is to build the kingdom of God one soul at a time. And if society goes to hell around us, well, that's not really our concern. We're to be focused on evangelism and disciple-making, not on rescuing the soul of our country. Well, the problem with this seemingly pious mentality is that it's tragically naive. Why? Well, for the simple reason that the gospel is never heard in a vacuum. It's never heard in isolation. Rather, it's always heard against the backdrop of a cultural milieu, of a cultural environment. Every culture has a set of background assumptions that sets a framework for how people think and evaluate ideas in that culture, for what they're willing to listen to, for how they feel and react to certain ideas, and for how they behave. And this set of background assumptions compromises what sociologists have called the plausibility structure of a society. The plausibility structure greatly influences what people will be willing to consider reasonable, rational, and worthy of evaluation. The plausibility structure of a culture is what basically sets the boundaries of what is rationally acceptable. And if an idea falls outside the bounds of a society's plausibility structure, very few within that society are going to be willing to even give it a hearing, let alone to carefully consider it as a live, rational option. Now, you can no doubt see the importance of a cultural plausibility structure for evangelism. In societies where the background assumptions of the culture are unfamiliar or hostile to Christianity, the gospel will not get much of a hearing and evangelism will be very difficult and will come with very little success. In his article, Christianity and Culture, the great Princeton theologian J. Gresham Macon declared, false ideas are the greatest obstacles to the reception of the gospel. We may preach with all the fervor of a reformer and yet succeed only in winning a straggler here and there 
If we permit the whole collective thought of the nation to be controlled by ideas which prevent Christianity from being regarded as anything more than a harmless delusion. To think that the state of our culture doesn't matter for the mission of the church is a grave error in judgment. Craig is instructive here, and we would do well to heed his warning. He writes, A person raised in a cultural milieu in which Christianity is still seen as an intellectually viable option will display an openness to the gospel, which a person who is secularized will not. For the secular person, you may as well tell him to believe in fairies or leprechauns as in Jesus Christ. Or, to give a more realistic illustration, it is like our being approached on the street by a devotee of the Hare Krishna movement who invites us to believe in Krishna. Such an invitation strikes us as bizarre, freakish, even amusing. But to a person on the streets of Bombay, such an invitation would, I assume, appear quite reasonable and be serious cause for reflection. I fear that evangelicals appear almost as weird to persons on the streets of Bonn, Stockholm, or Paris, as, the, as do the devotees of Krishna. For Craig, unless the church awakens to the call of intellectual engagement and takes up the task of apologetics, the United States is headed down a predictable road. Again, he writes, what awaits us in North America, should our slide into secularism continue unabated, is already evident in Europe. Although the majority of Europeans retain a nominal affiliation with Christianity, only about 10% are practicing believers, and less than half of those are evangelical in theology. The most significant trend in European religious affiliation is the growth of those classed as non-religious, from effectively 0% of the population in 1900 to over 22% today. As a result, Evangelism is immeasurably more difficult in Europe than in the United States. Having lived for 13 years in Europe, where I spoke evangelistically on university campuses across the continent, I can personally testify to how hard the ground is. It is difficult for the gospel even to get a hearing. If we think that the mission of our faith is completely unaffected by the state of our culture, we're deceiving ourselves. According to Moreland, no movement, political, religious, or otherwise, can survive with dignity or flourish in a culture if it allows the following to arise. First, a culture where its viewpoint is considered irrational by a significant number of people and is not adequately represented among the intellectual leaders who shape the plausibility structure of that culture. Second, a culture in which the movement itself enlists others to join, not primarily in terms of the importance of the ideas and the truth that defines the movement, but in terms of the satisfaction of felt needs for those who sign up. And third, an atmosphere wherein the movement does not mobilize a growing number of its soldiers to be articulate advocates and defenders of its ideology, who can engage in, deba in debate in the public square. Now, for those who are paying attention, it's not difficult to see that the cultural plausibility structure in America is already excluding the claims of Christianity as out of bounds and not worthy of consideration. Those of you who are older have already lived through the transformation of our culture's set of background assumptions that were once friendly to Christian belief to a disinterested secularism, dismissive of Christianity, and a postmodern secularism in which the message of Christianity is drowned in a sea of subjectivity. Many of you can remember the good old days prior to the secular drift when sharing the gospel was easy, since most people in this country were familiar with the basic tenets of Christianity and, evening, and even welcoming towards them. Today, our culture is rapidly transforming again, right before our eyes, moving beyond these forms of secularism, and is now embracing a new worldview, which is functioning, I would contend, as a kind of state-sponsored religion. Let's call it 
the religion of wokeism. Now, why do I call wokeism a new religion? Well, think about it. Because it has its own set of answers to the big questions in life. Questions that religions traditionally address, such as, why are we here? What is our purpose? What is good? What is evil? How do we find salvation? It has its own ethical system, complete with a new moral code, an ethical system diametrically opposed to the Christian ethic. It has its high priests and those who are sanctioned to speak for it. It has a kind of inquisition that pronounces certain ideas as heretical. And it even has its own form of excommunication. If you say something contrary to the religion of wokeism, well, you get canceled. Now, of course, with this new state-sponsored religion comes a new set of cultural background assumptions and a new plausibility structure. Under the various forms of old-fashioned secularism, Christianity was largely discounted as rationally unviable, or it was reinterpreted as just one among many religions. Under the new religion of wokeism, Christianity is seen as positively evil and hostile to the order of social justice. And it must be either reinterpreted so as to conform with the doctrines of the new religion or be removed from society like a malignant tumor. Evangelism was already becoming increasingly difficult under a plausibility structure largely dominated by secular ideas. Imagine how difficult it's going to become if the religion of wokeism takes over in this country as the dominant worldview. To have the gospel dismissed as irrational is one thing. To have it labeled as evil and a threat to society is something we have never experienced in this nation before. Now, please, hear me out. I'm not saying that the persistence of evangelical anti-intellectualism is the only or even the primary reason for the degradation of our culture. My claim is a modest one. The evangelical neglect of the mind, along with the evacuation of the cultural centers of influence, has significantly contributed to the rapid decline of American society. And as a result, it has inadvertently contributed to making the task of evangelism increasingly difficult. By neglecting the mind, the church is making her mission harder. And sadly, instead of the church influencing and shaping the culture, the culture is too often influencing and shaping the church. Os Guinness writes, failing to think Christianly, evangelicals have been forced into the role of cultural imitators and adapters rather than originators. In biblical terms, it's to be worldly and conformist, not decisively Christian. Tragically, there are many evangelical churches across our nation today that are absorbing the ideas and ideals of anti-Christian worldviews. Some are doing so unwittingly, letting the enemy through the gates, so to speak, by embracing a kind of Trojan horse, consisting of ideas that sound good to the ear, but are poison to the soul. And here I'm especially thinking about evangelical pastors who are embracing notions like social justice, equity, acceptance, without realizing that these words are terms of art that have their own meaning in a worldview that is positively hostile to Christianity. Now, unfortunately, some pastors are deliberately altering the message of Christianity to make it more palatable and acceptable to a culture gone mad. And these Christian leaders are willingly opening the gates to the false idol of wokeism and dancing before it as David danced before the ark. So whether unwittingly or deliberately, too many evangelical churches are giving away the high ground of Christian ethics to a godless religion with an abysmal moral code 
Too many churches are bending the knee to the cultural power brokers of our society. Not only is the church losing its saltiness in our culture, it's actually being seasoned by our culture. The influence is going the wrong way. These, then, are some of the crises, problems, troubles facing the church today that have come about, at least in part, because of the evangelical inattention to the mind. Now, I think the lesson here is clear. When we neglect the Christian mind, we do so to the detriment of the soul. The soul of the believer, the soul of the church, and the soul of the nation.